Chapter 1. Clouds and Dirt. In this chapter, I talk about prioritizing the oxygen of your business and why the middle sucks. I spend all my time in the clouds and dirt. The clouds are the high-end philosophy and beliefs that are at the heart of everything I am personally and everything I do professionally. Personally, it's really simple. Family first. Nothing else matters. Professionally, it's not that much different. That's what I often tell my staff at VaynerMedia. 99% of what we deal with every day in business doesn't matter. This statement usually gets me a mix of confused, curious, and even disdainful looks from my new top executives or employees hearing it for the first time because of course they think what they do is very important and everything matters. But it's not true. If you religiously follow just the few core business philosophies that mean most to you and spend all your time there, everything else will naturally fall into place. My clouds are extremely simple and may sound familiar to anybody that's been following me for a while. Bring value to the customer. Provide 51% of the value in relationships, whether it's with an employee, a client, or a stranger. Always, and I mean always, play the long game of lifetime value. Smart work will never replace hard work. It only supplements it. People are the most important commodity. Patience, my friends, matters. Next, never be romantic about how you make your money. Also, try to put yourself out of business daily. Those are my commandments. By the way, I'm going to go back to the last one because, boy, that's going to confuse a lot of you that are listening to this or discovering me for the first time. When I say try to put yourself out of business daily, it means challenge what you're doing because somebody else is trying to take you down, take your spot, win, and if you're not evolving your product or service, you will lose. And I'm very proud that I never get caught up in my own headlines or what I'm doing well of the moment and always challenging myself of like, how am I going to put myself out of business? Because my friends, putting yourself out of business is a lot more fun than having somebody else do it for you. So you see, the clouds don't just represent the big picture, they represent the huge picture, the everything. They're not goals. Goals can be achieved and set aside or moved. I'm going to buy the New York Jets, that's a goal. It drives me. But it's not the core of how I run my businesses. The dirt is about being a practitioner and executing towards those clouds. It's the hard work. On a personal level, my dirt is making sure I communicate well with my loved ones and that I show up and stay present and that I apologize when I mess up and that I make sure it doesn't happen too often. You know, the stuff of being a good spouse, parent, son, sibling, and friend. Professionally, it's knowing my craft. It's knowing that there's a 15-person limit on an Instagram chat and that infographics over-index on Pinterest. It's understanding Facebook ads and the ROI of Vine. It's noticing changes and trends and figuring out how to take advantage of them before anybody else. The vast majority of people tend to play in the middle, which is why they usually only succeed up to a certain level and then plateau. Alternatively, they get stuck in one or the other, getting so bogged down by the minutia or politics that they lose sight of the clouds, or so into the clouds that they lose their appetite or neglect the skills they need to execute successfully. Ideas are worthless without execution. Execution is pointless without the ideas. You have to learn how to prioritize properly and quickly identify what's going to move you further ahead and what's going to make you stall. I saw how these tendencies played out early in my career in the wine industry. I encountered a lot of amazing wine people with brilliant palates whose businesses stunk because they weren't good at that part. Conversely, I'd met with some of the best wine retailers in the country, and I was shocked by their actual lack of knowledge about wine itself. A great wine merchant has to be a business person first and a great wine person second. But the second part really does matter. I always thought the reason the success of my family business, Wine Library, accelerated so quickly once I got involved was that I took both seriously. I knew my business, but I also knew my craft. And that practitionership loving wine, tasting as many as I could, and caring about the regions and producers created tremendous value for my customers and ridiculous ROI for me. I see a similar phenomenon in today's marketing world. At this point in my career, I've sat down hundreds of times to meet with people claiming to be social media experts, only to discover that they have gaping holes in their knowledge about the platforms and little idea of how they've changed over time. 
This is why I feel justified telling potential clients that if they work with me, they'll be working with the best social media practitioner at the best social media agency in the country. Because at VaynerMedia, the clouds matter and the dirt matters and nothing else. There are too many people who are average at what they do and then confused by their average results. Everyone has their own definition of clouds and dirt. But if there's any advice that I can offer you that will change the entire trajectory of your career, it's to start pushing at both edges. Raise the bar of your business philosophy. Dig deeper into your craft. You want to make sure that you're equally an architect and a mason. You've got to be able to simultaneously think at a high level and get your hands dirty. Hey everybody, real quick, before we get deep into this audiobook, I want you to know I've asked a bunch of my special friends to ask the questions for this audiobook, to change up the cadence, allow you to hear some different voices. I do want to remark, and I want you to know, that these are not the people that actually asked these questions. They're just the ones reading them. These are questions that were asked on the show, and a magnitude of other questions that I came up with, or other people have asked in different formats. Hi guys, it's Seth Godin, blogger, author, and entrepreneur. You can find me by Googling Seth. I am thrilled to be invited to be a volunteer moderator slash question asker in the Ask Gary V book. Can you elaborate on what the middle is and why it sucks? First off, Seth, thank you so much for being the first person reading. I think uh, if you're listening to this right now, you uh, have gotten the first taste into something very clever. Somewhere along the line, when I was thinking about the audio book, I said, you know, it'd be really fun to get some of my marketing and business and just friends to ask the questions and then I'll answer it. Having Seth Godin, one of the iconic business authors of our time to start this off feels just right. I didn't pick the order. I'm sure Hollis or Steph or my producers here did a great job with that, but boy, does it feel exactly right. So Seth, thank you, my friend. The middle. The middle is somewhere that you and I, Seth, do not play. The middle is the middle is the 99% of people, businesses, that I see every single day. Every day, I interact with hundreds of people, my employees, uh, outside business personalities, interviewers, just lots and lots of people. Also, because I've been investing for the last seven or eight years, I'm pitched multiple times a week, 10, 20 times a week by businesses. You know, businesses that come in and whatever is the, you know, here's a good example, Uber, right? As soon as Uber exploded, every single person came in and said, we're going to be the Uber for babysitting. We're going to be the Uber for landscaping. We're going to be the Uber of that. Or we're going to be the Instagram of this and the Instagram of that. It's not an original idea. It's a small iteration. It's the middle. It's something that doesn't really change the game. And it's these ideas. And I talk a lot about execution, but it's these ideas that are not actually engaging or changing the marketplace. It's mundane. It's much of the same. And most of all, it's what keeps people down. We are not pushing ourselves to enough clouds or dirt like I talked about earlier. So what I mean by that is I rarely find somebody who's a direct practitioner, somebody that really understands their craft or somebody on the other side of the equation who really has a big idea, who says something that makes me say, holy crap, is that possible? By pushing yourself in both directions. And listen, the dirt part's easy. If you're a practitioner, you can just keep practicing. You can keep practicing. On the clouds part, you just might have the talent to dream bigger and don't let people suppress those massive dreams. So when I talk about the middle, I talk about the majority of what we're all doing all the time. Take a step back and try to think about pushing on both of those edges. How do you know how much time to give to clouds versus dirt? Should you base your decision on your personality, your strengths? This is a really great question. So this one I'm gonna really break down very carefully. First of all, self-awareness is a gift. If you're lucky enough to be self-aware of who you are, this should be very easy to answer, right? You may be a strategist, an architect, you think big, but you realize you've never done anything, right? You've never actually executed it. You're just always dreaming. Now. That's fine, and that could actually be quite special, and you should probably triple down on that, but not having some percentage to the execution will keep you vulnerable. You'll just be that guy or gal that's 68 years old that says, I could have, I should have. Remember when I, you know, actually I'm going on a tangent here. Do you know many of you that are listening right now said the following thing? Oh, I had the idea for Facebook before Facebook, or I thought that the Uber idea, I thought about that Uber idea years ago. You're just dreaming, and that's great, but what I would say the ideal percentage is minimally to really frame this is somewhere in the ballpark of 70-30. You're gonna need to have both. And you need to have both unless you go in a completely different direction, which is getting a partner that does the complete other thing. But partnerships are difficult and have all their other kind of variables, so I don't wanna necessarily get into that. I would say that the number one thing you need to realize is that both matter, 
but you should lean towards what comes most natural to you. You know, for me, I'm kind of weird. I almost feel like I am 50-50. Maybe it's why I came up with it. I actually struggle with the fact that I value the dirt so much. I like operating. At this point in my career, so many of my contemporaries and friends yell at me for running VaynerMedia, but I love the dirt. I'm a practitioner. I love my craft. And so I, I lean on my strengths, which both really work for me. On the flip side, I have many people working for me or companies that I've invested in. David Karp comes to mind at Tumblr. What an incredible cloud executor. His ideas were revolutionary, and he was able to have a billion-dollar exit to Yahoo on so much of what he thought, not as much on what Tumblr became or not. And so I think you need to really recognize who you are, but find some sort of balance. 100-0 requires partnerships. Anything else closer to 70-30, 50-50, that's when you can start moving and attack. When is a long tail actually just moving the goalpost? As most of my followers know, I want to buy the New York Jets. I've wanted to buy the Jets since I was a little kid. Three decades later, I'm still at it, but I'm not tired. That's how long term I am. Owning the New York Jets will be a byproduct of ignoring anything other than the clouds and the dirt. I consider every decision I make from launching VaynerMedia to writing books to public speaking to doing a podcast as a chess move and I don't make a chess move unless it gets me closer to the Jets one day. But I suspect what you're thinking is, big picture is great, but what if you're ignoring all the little stuff and the short term? Will you ever really reach your goal? I say yes, because when you have a big picture, a North Star, a true long-term vision, something interesting happens. You stop stressing the dumb little shit day in and day out, because you're playing the big game. So the short-term angst, which is really just a byproduct of the friction caused by growth, becomes a little bit more manageable. And when you're not stressing, you've got a whole lot more energy to go all in. If you're single-mindedly focused on your long-term goal, your long tail, you'll be more effective in the short-term and get there faster. Where do you see yourself in five years? It's very difficult for me to see myself in five years because uh, I just recognize how impractical that is in the world that we now live in today. Look, Snapchat and Instagram and, and GoPro didn't even exist five years ago. Uh, when you think about where people's attention is today, it shifted to mobile devices from televisions and print magazines in five years. The world is moving faster than we've ever seen before. Personally, five years from now, with kids that are six and three of this uh, recording, uh, I'd like to think I'm spending a lot more time at ball games and ballets and, and functions. Uh, I'm really excited about the next half decade in my family life. But as a business person, and, and really probably a, a, as a human overall, I'm a halftime adjustments coach, right? I'm a, I'm a counter puncher. I'm the kind of guy that tastes, as I like to use that slang term, tastes the current state of my life, the current state of my businesses, and I adjust to those realities. I'm not the head coach that stays up all night, all week, has the greatest game plan, and goes out and dominates. I'm actually one that probably thinks and has a solid game plan, but might be down 27 to 15 at halftime. But because I got to watch what happened on the field in the first half, I can make all those adjustments in 15 minutes that we're going to go out and blow out the other team in the second half. That's how I run my business. That's how I run my personal personal life. And so for me to begin to predict where I'm going to be in five years is just not real, not even five months. And so reactionary is my religion. What's the biggest lesson you learned this year? The number one thing I learned about myself is that I'm capable of actually fixing something that doesn't come naturally to me. See, there's a dirty little secret that even a lot of you that follow me the closest don't know, which is my whole belief on betting on your strengths is even more insane in my own execution. I punted school. I, I, I knew I wasn't good at it, and at 12 years old, I stopped focusing on it. And there was one thing that had been hovering over me for the last decade that I knew I wasn't good at. Working out and taking care of my health. And so what 2015 really meant to me and really early 2016 is like, my God, I've actually figured out how to take care of my health. I've been able to figure out a system by hiring a full-time health employee. I wasn't accountable to myself, but in the same way that I figure out businesses, I took a step back and I realized how I could be successful. And what I did was I hired the infrastructure and became accountable to somebody else instead of myself when it comes to health. This has led to a much better healthy lifestyle, but most importantly, has made me confident that for the next 60 years, unlike the last 20 years, I don't need to default into thinking, well, 
I'm gonna go all in on my strengths and I'm not gonna worry about the things I suck at. No, it taught me that I was capable of fixing something that didn't come naturally to me. And to be honest with you, it's one of the most empowering feelings I've ever felt. What is an area in life where you haven't given it your fullest efforts? Obviously, I just spoke about health and I've started hacking at that quite aggressively and that is emerging and, and kind of now all in fullest for sure. I think the other area that I've thought about quite a bit is nonprofit NGO charities. Uh, for a very long time, I kind of thought of myself as the cliche, I'm going to make it, and in my 60s or 70s, I'm going to give back. Then I adjusted as I started making more money and started giving away some of it along the way. But boy, is it easy to write a check if you've been fortunate enough to have a couple of bucks laying around. So I started joining boards and started getting involved with certain charities, and now I'm a very proud, active member of Pencils of Promise, something that takes up a lot of my time, which is my favorite asset, but allows me to feel like I'm giving my fullest. I've also been thinking a lot more about my time with my children. I think one of the things that I want to hack at is to find ways to come home more in the middle of the day and maybe give them a bath or have dinner with them because Monday through Friday, if I'm in New York and obviously when I'm traveling, I'm just not seeing them and spending time. And though I'm winning through extremism, which is all in on the weekends and quite a bunch of vacation time, I feel like I'm just coming up a hair short on a little bit more allocation of time. So that's important to me. And then I do have the New York Jets, as so many of you know, and so Sunday is my time in the fall. Uh, I'm trying to figure out just some other thing that's kind of me time, right? Right now, me time is jets, and me time, believe it or not, and this is going to sound very weird, is being on a plane. <laughs> Nobody else can bother me, and I kind of, kind of zen together. I think me time, which is emerging even as I'm talking to you right now, is me and my wife time. Lizzie and I just took a vacation together, and it was incredible. How do I get a little me time? Because I'm so on all the time with my business uh, and my family responsibilities. Just a hair more on that me time. Got to figure that out. What motivates you to keep going, to continue a project without seeing any significant growth as you go? You know, at the end of the day, I always know why I do things. So when I start something, there was always a why. There was a reason I wanted to start this project, hire this person, start this company, invest in this company. There was always a belief and a reason I did it. The other thing that allows me to do it is I'm remarkably patient. I am so much more patient than most of you. It's just my truth. Uh, as a matter of fact, patience is my gift and my curse. I may end up one day being too patient because I'm always hedging and investing in the future. So I think about it, but it is absolutely the reason that I'm able to wait to see significant growth. And then finally, even if it's a loss, I know that there's gonna be massive learnings from the process. Some of the greatest decisions I've made in my career was because I made bad decisions three or four years ago and it taught me how to tweak it this time around because the themes come over and over. To me, this is it's attractive actually in a weird way to not see significant growth right away or even midterm. So that's how I do it. Does VaynerMedia focus much energy on winning awards? And what's your take on the ad industry's obsession with awards in general? Many of the executives of VaynerMedia have been asking me why we focus so little on awards in an industry that does it all the time. And I answer them very easily. I say, guys, why does an agency want to win an award? Why? Why is that good? And I'll tell you why. There's two reasons. One, it attracts great new talent. Oh, I want to work at that agency and win awards too. And two, it attracts new business. Clients come to you. Well, I've been able to build VaynerMedia very quickly on my salesmanship and my thesis and strategies, so getting new businesses have never been an issue for us. And number two, I don't necessarily want talent that cares more about winning an award than it does about selling stuff for the clients that hired them. I'm not mad at the advertising agency's obsession and industry's obsession with these awards because I understand why so many other people need them to justify growth or make business. It's just not in it for me, and so thus, we don't need to focus on it. If you had a seven-acre vineyard, how would you sell lots of wine? How would you do things differently compared to all the other vineyards out there? Growing up in the wine business since I was 14 allows me to really understand this question. And as you can imagine, many times through my career, I thought about what if I owned a winery? If I had a small New Zealand winery, for example, uh, I would do several things. I would do clouds and I would do dirt. Let me explain. Clouds. I would take a step back and become a media company. What do I mean by that? 
I mean that I would literally record, whether through Periscope or Snapchat, putting it on YouTube or starting a podcast. Literally, I would talk about every single thing that happened every single day at the winery. A big new sale, a restaurant pouring it, the grapes getting too cold. I would storytell, become a media company, get people more emotional about what I do and what we do and who we are. But then I would equally focus on the dirt. And remember, I live this. Wine Library TV made me internet famous, made Wine Library famous. I started showing up on Conan O'Brien and Ellen and the Today Show and all these famous places. And so I had all these accolades. Yet, every time you didn't see me on big television shows, I was downstairs hand selling wine, (laughs) cutting cardboard up, just still getting my hands dirty in the dirt. And if I was a winery, I'd be doing the same. Even though we were doing this incredible podcast and people started watching us on Snapchat and all these great things, I would still all the time go door to door to restaurants, try to get them to pour. I would have my Saturday at a big store in Australia, for example, because it's a big market. I'd fly to, you know, Sydney and pour at that store on a Saturday and get everybody excited about my product. I would train sales staff. And so that's how I would think about it. I believe becoming a media company is very practical. I believe the day and age of technology now allows you to create a reality show around your world on a daily basis and whether you talk to the cake boss or all these other places it's impacted their business you can do that now too what would you prioritize as a one person business cash and i say that emphatically because i need everybody to understand this it is stunning to me how many one person shows don't realize that sales and cash is the most important thing you have to live your life it's all on your shoulders and the only way to survive and go to the next level is that cash is coming in so first and foremost cash do you have a sustainable business that pays for your lifestyle are you paying off your loans are you paying your rent hardcore practicality number two only doing things that you're good at because there's so limited time in a day, you've got to make sure that you're using it the best way possible. The way to do that is to actually do what you do. So if you're an artist and you're trying to sell paintings, you know, the cliche thing is an artist isn't a good salesperson. They're just a great artist. So maybe you shouldn't be spending 15 hours a day trying to sell the stuff. Maybe you should be creating and then you get to step three, outsourcing. Maybe you're bad at filing your taxes. Maybe you can't sell for a lick. You need to find somebody on a commission or some sort of deal structure that allows you to focus all your time on your skill, which, which, which would then create cash and then outsource the things that you're not good at. And then finally, I would focus on giving up the rest of your life. And I'm not joking, let me explain. Way too many people are solopreneurs, relying on themselves, have the audacity to try to start a business for themselves, and then they spend time playing Madden football on PlayStation, and then they spend time going to parties, and then they spend time on the softball team. If you wanna be your own business, you've got to, especially in the first three to five years, punt everything else so you have 17 hours a day to focus on doing the things you're best at. And by the way, you might not be able to afford a salesperson, so even though you stink at selling, you just might have to do it. And that comes out of the bowling team. And one last time, something I like to say all the time, cash is oxygen. It's how you stay alive. Hey there, this is Steve Unwin, AKA Stunwin, broadcasting live from VaynerMedia headquarters. I am Gary's editor-in-chief and the first official member of the Dope Den. Let's read some questions. If cash is oxygen is your top priority as a one-person business, what comes second? Product, team, or service? Well, let's start with this. There is no second because I want to pound this thesis down because, guys, I'm the byproduct of the last seven years of my life getting thousands of emails of people that went out of business because they weren't thinking about cash. So I'm going to say it one more time, and now I'm going to actually answer the question. I think this goes back down to uh, the prior answer, which is strengths, right? I think you've got to put yourself in a position to succeed. This really wraps up the theme of this chapter, clouds and dirt. I would almost say that the dirt in all these conversations is the cash, right? It's the practical thing that allows you to kind of keep on moving but the clouds are your skill sets the place where you can take it to the next level so if I were you I would really focus quite a bit of time on one of two things one deploying some of that cash to a second person that rounds out your skill sets one of the things that I'm very concerned about is people take on more cash than they need let me explain because I want to be very clear here 
If you're making $97,000 a year, you don't need to live a $97,000 a year lifestyle. Maybe you live a $60,000 a year lifestyle, which then gives you $37,000 to hire the accountant, to hire the salesperson, and now you're building towards the future. Now you're trying to build something instead of just maintaining what you've got. That is what I would focus on, taking a step back and really realizing that's the key move. The other thing you can do, and, and, and I'm saying this in a very interesting way, I'd be curious to why you're listening to this book if, if this is you, but I'm going to go there, which is maybe you just don't want to buy the New York Jets. Maybe, maybe what happens next is you take a step back. I'm going very zen here. Maybe what you do next is you take a step back and say, are you happy? Maybe you're just happy. Maybe you don't need to grow. Maybe a $97,000 a year lifestyle is perfect and you don't want to invest in something else that gets you to a buck 50. And maybe what you should do is take a step back and do nothing and be very happy and be thankful and grateful that you are where you are. So I think at the end of the day, once you realize if you're going to be a business, you need to have enough cash to live. The next step is how do you want to live?